So if we have a bar, and we're going to pull on it with a stress Y, right? And initially, we have a coordinate system x1, x2. And we want to see what happens as we rotate that coordinate system through some angle theta to, say, x1 prime, x2 prime. All right, well, what's, what's the stress tensor here? The only force I'm applying is in the x1 direction, right? And I, and I said this is a stress, so y. Applying a traction, right? So it's y. There's no, there's no other traction, so everything else is 0. Okay. And in this case, it's easy enough to just, we know the rotation matrix is the cosine of theta, sine theta minus sine theta cosine theta 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. <clears throat> so in this case, you know, we're interested in finding y prime, so how the stress changes given a rotation of the coordinate system, right? And in this case, it's easy enough to just compute it, just compute the rotation. And, and and this, again, would be, you know, no matter how complicated the stress tensor is, nowadays you just plug this into Mathematica or whatever. But <clears throat> if we do, we say R sigma R transpose, then what we'll find is that the sigma 1, 1 component is equal to R cosine theta, right? And the sigma prime 1, 2 component is equal to R y over 2 sine theta cosine theta, which is equal to y over 2 sine 2 theta. And if we were to track theta from 0 to pi, what you'd see is that this guy reaches a maximum at 45 degrees. So it's a maximum. So the shear is a maximum when the rotation equals 45 degrees. And the reason that's insightful, if you, if you know anything, you know, later on we'll discuss some failure criteria. And a lot of, you know, one common failure criterion is a max, maximum shear stress criteria. And so a material, and it's typically brittle materials that do this, that, that fail under maximum shear stress criteria, will almost always fail at a 45 degree angle like that. And that, this is why. Okay, we're going to talk about another special case of these Mohr circles. So if we have a very thin plate, draw a coordinate system such that we have like n1, n2, n3. A very thin plate that we're going to load along its long axis. So in, in this scenario, <coughs> well, I'm going to ask the question, what is the traction vector on a free surface? 
Yeah. And so on any free surface, so we're not cutting the body. I'm talking about right on the surface, right? So on the free surface, the traction vector is zero, right? And so if we use our Cauchy stress equation, Multiply that times the normal vector on the surface is what? Like, so let's talk about this surface, the, 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 the top surface. The normal vector is N3, right? So 0, 0, 1. And we know that that must equal 0. Because we said the traction vector on the surface is stress-free, right? So that means that sigma 1, 3, sigma 2, 3, and sigma 3, 3 is equal to 0, right? And if the stress is symmetric, then you have sigma 3, 1 equal to sigma 3, 2 equal to 0 as well through symmetry, right? Okay, so <clears throat> if we have this really thin thing, and this is part of the assumption here is that it's really thin, right? Long and thin. So if the stress here, if these stresses are zero, and the same thing, you know, the other side has a free surface too, so the traction there is zero too, and the stress here is zero, right? So the stress at a point just beneath the surface is zero, and, you know, a point just beneath the surface is zero. And it's really thin, such that these two points are really close to one another. Then what do you say about the stress through the thickness? So if this is zero and this is zero, yeah, I mean, it's a good approximation to say if it's thin, stress at the top is zero, stress at the bottom is zero, it's very unlikely that the stress in between them is going to be big, right? So. Then, then we say that, you know, the entire, so that we basically make the approximation that the entire through thickness or the entire body has these components, these zeroed out components of stress. And so that's why we call this plane, and it's P-L-A-N-E, like a plane, right, S stress, as opposed to P L A N, like plane. Uh, how would you describe that plane? Like simple. <laughs> right. So it turns out that with this, we can basically just through simple geometry define a set of circles here, too, such that <clears throat> if we have state of stress sigma x and sigma y. So this again is the normal component and the shear component. Then, you know, we, now we just have, because of, the, because of the simplification, there's just one circle. And, you know, now we can basically just define that circle, you know, through geometry. So the circle is going to be centered or not centered, rather, but um, let's see. So I shouldn't use x and y because I haven't been using them. Let's let's do this. So if we have a if we we have the tensor, and now since all those other components are zero, it can be completely defined by sigma one one sigma 2, 2, and sigma 1, 2, right? Because everything else is zero, we can completely define this stress like that, right? Okay, so the center then, 
the center of this guy is going to be here, it's going to be sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 divided by 2, right? And the radius then, so this radius can be defined as sigma x minus, ah oh, dang it, I keep using x's, sorry. I used them in my notes, and but I haven't used them yet. So it, it'll be sigma 1, 1 minus sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 over 2 squared plus sigma 1, 2 squared. So that's just from geometry, right? So that's just, just the uh, Pythagorean theorem, right? That we compute this radius. So then if we draw a circle that passes through that point, that's not a very good circle. And then this angle here is 2 theta, and we could, that's just from geometry too, so tangent 2 theta is equal to 2, 1, 2, Okay, so then this is the plain stress Mohr circle, and by the way, I just want to say, y'all, y'all are bored. I don't find this terribly fascinating either. I just feel obligated to teach it because it's in every textbook, you know, on on elasticity or continuum mechanics. And like I said, I think it shows up in like PE exams and other things. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll quickly move on to things that I find more fascinating, but I feel, feel an obligation to talk about this stuff. Okay, so then I also have a demonstration for a plain stress Mohr circle. <clears throat> and this one actually, you know, it could be useful, I guess, uh, because like I said, in a plain stress scenario, the state of stress is completely defined by sigma 1, 1, sigma 1, 2, and sigma 2, 2. So in this case, if you know what those values are, right, and, you know, here I've got slider bars, but you could actually implement the, you know, you could put in a value, 1, whatever. Right. <clears throat> and then you know how much you were going to rotate your body then the, the sigma prime, or the state of stress in the rotated configuration, or rotated coordinate system is, is you know, output here. And then all the geometry is shown on there. So I'm actually going to post these little demonstrations as little web apps to the website, so you can get on and play with them too, I guess. So if you can't see them real well, you can get on and play with them. And I don't know that it'll be quicker to do versus, say, using MATLAB, but on at least one of your homework problems, you could probably solve it with this thing by just inputting the right values and, and getting the, the output. So in that case, it could, could be useful, um, <clears throat> but it's mostly for just for illustration. So I'm not going to work through all the details, but I do want to talk about uh, plain strain real quick, since we talked about plain stress. So in plain strain, it's just the opposite. So plain strain, plain stress, remember thin. That's what, you know. I always associated plain stress with thin things, right? In plain strain, then what's the assumption? If it's not thin, it's thick. Right? So thick. So this is a lot, this is a lot of times the approximation we use in geomechanics, right? So if you have a body and you're interested in the deformations in this plane, you can make the assumption, if it's really thick, 
that the strain in that direction, and let's say that this is the, the, uh, the, the you know, x3 direction. Well, I don't have to draw it like that. I can, I can say, uh, So the strain in the x3 direction would be zero. And that comes from, you know, if you just think about what the 3, 3 or the strain in this direction from kind of an engineering sense, right, the change in length over length. Well, if the length, as the, as the length gets, approaches infinity, right, as it becomes thicker and thicker, then any small change in length is going to make, it doesn't matter, right? As, as L approaches infinity, this approaches zero. So in that case, then you know you get that th this guy is zero, and likewise the shear strains, any sh combination of shear strains in the three direction would be zero. So you'd have that, you know, sigma one three. Uh, I'm sorry, epsilon one three, epsilon two three, epsilon three three equals zero. And what do we know about if we're talking about our small strain tensor? What do we know about our small strain tensor? As far as like, you know, can I say anything about the symmetry of it? It is always symmetric, right? So you remember our definition was one half grad U plus grad U transpose. Well, this is the symmetric, I mean, the definition of it is the symmetric part of grad U, right? I mean, this is the definition of the symmetric operator, right? That's that's it. So it's definitely symmetric, and so in that case, sigma three one, sigma three two would also be equal to zero. Okay. And so that's that's the plain strain assumption, and you know there's so there's also all the geometry is the same after that. I mean there's a there's a more circle associated with plain strain. So all the equations, all the geometry is it's identical. All right, so it looks like I have about 10 minutes. I was going to go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and switch to a new piece of paper. 